guy goes into a bookstore, goes up to the counter and says, excuse me, can you tell me where the self-help section is? And the person at the desk looks at him and says, wouldn't that defeat the purpose? Supposedly, that's a true story. I wonder if the person regretted saying that. Probably not. But I do want to talk a little bit about the the theme of regret. Uh, it's this is the time of year when we we have a tendency to kind of look back over what we accomplished and what we didn't accomplish. And I do my my annual year in review, which I've been doing for a number of years, and. I get to look back at all the stuff I said I would do that I didn't get to, which sometimes has some regret to it. What I'd like to talk about is how, is when you begin to turn your attention to this topic of regret, for many of us, we recognize that we, we live with regret. I mean, regret is part of the human experience. But I'd like to talk a little bit about how to how to be with that, how to how to heal regret, and as well to talk about some of the strategies for moving forward in life. You know, all great traditions have have guidelines uh, how to how to get the most out of your life. And of course, different traditions say different things, but it's up to each of us to find out how do I want to live? What are the rules I'm going to live by? And I'd like to talk finally a little bit about how to move forward in life to live as regret-free as possible at the end of your life. When I was uh, in high school, I, I had the, the great fortune to go to a boarding school uh, from age 13 on. And my, my roommate one year was... Uh, his name was Gil Hines. He was from southern South Philly. And uh, we were best friends. And um, he went, he traveled with my family once, and I went down to his family in South Carolina uh, once. And, and we got so we could do our accents perfectly. You know, I could do him, and he could do me. He's an African-American guy. And uh, we all, always had fun mixing it up. But there would be times I would come back into the room, I'd say, damn, what's your shit doing on my bed? And he'd jump up and say, oh, gosh, let me clean it up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but we, we fell out of touch, as happens. And this was a number of years ago. I got an email from him just saying he'd like to connect. And we emailed back and forth a little bit. And I was really, really busy. And... Um, and then I kind of let it go. And then he called me. And I didn't return the call. And then I found out that he had been dying of cancer. And sitting with that regret of someone who had been such a dear friend and being too busy to respond it was something that I really sat with and still sit with uh, for a long time. Regret is a, a big part of life. And, and you may know there's a beautiful book written about the, the regrets of the dying. And the number one regret of, of the dying is I wasn't true to myself. And some others, I wish I didn't work so hard. I wish I didn't hold back my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with friends. I wish I had cared less about what other people think of me. I wish I didn't worry so much. I wish I had taken better care of myself. I wish I didn't take life for granted. And I wish I lived more in the now. And you can feel the regret in that, like the deep regret. How is it that we fall out of living a life we want to live and fall into the trance of, of being someone who's on their way somewhere or missing 
like the deepest intuitive callings that we have. A recent study on regret, 18% of people regret past romance or lost love, 16% family related, education 13%, finance, parenting uh, 13 and 10%. Half of our regrets are connected to our relationships. And it's interesting how when you look at regret, there are really two kinds of regret. What is the regret for the things we did but wish we hadn't done? That's like choosing a, a practical and safe job rather than the one you are called to, or being unskillful and taking care of your body, marrying someone who is safe but not, not enlivening, choosing a job that gave you more money but less time to be with family, Joining a, joining a group of friends that you know isn't really good for you. So those are the actions you take that you regret. But then there are all the things we didn't do that we could have done. And the list here is, tends to be longer. And again, in some of the interviews, the people are saying, not standing up to the bullies in my life not staying in touch with good friends from childhood, not putting my phone away, um, breaking up a relationship with someone that, that I really loved, um, not applying for the job that I really wanted, not going on more trips with family and friends, not spending more time with kids, not burying the hatchet with a family member, not trusting the voice in the back of my head, not having the courage to speak at a funeral, not visiting a friend before he died, not learning another language. It's much, much harder to heal the regrets of inaction. And so the regrets of inaction of not taking the next step, possibly missing out on something. These are the deepest regrets that, that we carry inside. A great quote from Terry Malloy in On the Waterfront. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which I am. Implicit here is, is karma, you know, action and reaction. What did we miss? That's where the regret is. What did I miss by not going a little further, taking that risk? So when we begin to recognize our inactions or our unskillful actions. How do we, how do we be with that? There's a story, um, uh, from the, the Buddhist time, one of the classic stories of a, of a young man who was really smart and kind of studying the Dharma and, um, his, the people who were studying with were, were jealous of him and they turned their teacher against him. And so he went from probably this, this bright prodigy to, to the, the other side where he became, he became a thief and he became a, kind of a wicked person, uh, created a huge amount of suffering, you know, everywhere he went. And then the story is that he encountered these teachings, you know, these teachings of liberation and they, they touched him very deeply and he started to follow the teachings and became a monk and became a renunciate, you know, gave away everything to, to practice the teachings full time. And when the uh, monks would go out on alms rounds asking for, asking for, uh, you know, for food, uh, some people in the village recognized him, uh, people who had been harmed by him and he was, you know, beaten terribly. 
but he recognized the karma of his past actions and sort of endured those beatings as part of a, like a purification process. And what happens when we, when we really encounter our regrets and we, we investigate our regrets, it requires that we really feel the, the pain of that regret and we feel it in a way that we can really, really, really get it, which can inform us how we want to move into the future. And again, as I, as I, as I think of these talks, you know, my mind always goes there. And so, of course, I've been surfacing all kinds of regrets all week. But I was reminded once, um, when I lived in the ashram, I did a lot of fundraising. And um, I would give a lot of talks um, about um, the work we were doing and encouraging people to give. This was way, way back in the AIDS crisis when no one really knew what it was. And there was this young guy who, who asked to talk to me after one of my talks. And, uh, and, and I realized he just needed to talk. And, and I could tell he wasn't, he wasn't well. And at that time, because we had a large program center with thousands of people coming, there was a decision in the organization to, uh, that if anyone had AIDS, they were not allowed to be uh, in our facility because, you know, we didn't know how infectious it was at that time. And so every week he would come and he would just talk and talk and talk. And I could tell he needed to talk. And, uh, and then he told me that, that he had AIDS. And he told me about, you know, his lifestyle. And I could tell there was really no one who could really listen. And, but I was conflicted because I was told um, that he couldn't be here. And so I elected not to tell anyone in the organization because it seemed so important for him to, to be there. And, uh, and so he would come from time to time, and then he would come less. And then he stopped coming. And again, at a very, very busy time in my life, I realized that I never, I never followed up. You know, I never, I never tracked him down. And again, just that sense of, of regret that again, I, I got swept away by the busyness of my life. And here was someone who was very present in my life and then drifted away. And I realized how easy it was just to stay busy. But the challenge was to really feel that, to kind of feel the, my, own, my own insensitivity, uh, my own unwillingness to really, really deeply feel what he was going through uh, at the end of his life and my lack of following up. But what arose from that was a very, very deep intention to be more sensitive in the future, to really see when people are, are suffering, to slow myself down, to have that intention, to slow down and be, be more present. There's a wonderful phrase. Of course, when there is regret, there's, there's some lack of forgiveness toward ourselves. And the phrase, the, the phrases go like this. I allow myself to be imperfect. I allow myself to make mistakes. I allow myself to be a learner, still learning life's lessons. If I cannot forgive myself now, May I forgive myself sometime in the future. And I found great healing in those words. And I thought we might just do a short reflection. If you like, you can close your eyes. And we're just going to do just a little reflection on something where you may feel some regret in your life. And you might just take a few moments and just sense, is there, is there just one thing that comes forward as you sit for this brief meditation? 
you might elect not to take on the, the massive regret you're holding if it feels like it's too much. But something that you feel sorry for. And you might take a moment to close your eyes and it can be helpful to to draw it a little bit closer if you can create a representative image, a still image or a moving image that represents this issue. It's helpful to sense perhaps if there are any words or sounds or a tone of voice that you associate with this. And if it feels okay, if it feels safe, you might begin to sense what it feels like inside as you think about this. Can you locate that feeling on the inside? And the first step is to let it know you see it. And can you be with it for a little while? And is it possible to offer this some kind of loving presence, some empathy or kindness or compassion? Can you forgive yourself for not knowing what you know now? And you might reflect on these phrases, either just repeating them internally or letting them kind of wash through. I allow myself to be imperfect. I allow myself to make mistakes. I allow myself to be a learner, still learning life's lessons. I forgive myself. If I cannot forgive myself now, may I forgive myself sometime in the future. And you might just sense in your own way, if you could forgive yourself and if you were forgiven, what might that feel like? What might that be like inside? If in your regret you may have harmed another, you might explore the following phrases. Please allow me to be imperfect. Please allow me to make mistakes. Please allow me to be a learner, still learning life's lessons. If you cannot forgive me now, please try to forgive me sometime in the future. And if you were forgiven, just imagine or feel what that would feel like. If you like, you can deepen the breath. And if you like, you can open the eyes so you can remain with them closed. Quite often we go through life accumulating regrets without taking the time to really let them heal. And I've certainly met a lot of people in my life who, who haven't. And 
as people age, you can see just how deeply those regrets inform and inform us through life. So part of the practice is the courage to name it and to, to draw it forward and to feel it and explore what it needs, which quite often is some form of forgiveness. And again, there's that sense of looking back and forgiving yourself for not knowing what you know now. It's only when we really feel the, the hurt, like the ouch in our regrets, that we can make choices that can be more conscious, that are more in alignment with where we want to be. And one of the gifts of, of exploring regret is how sensitized the heart becomes when we recognize the harm we've done to ourselves or others through our fear or our need to control or our ignorance, there can be out of that kind of a rebirth of a fresh intention. The story that I find so powerful, I come back to the story again and again. It's a story about the Dalai Lama. And he was being interviewed by a reporter and the reporter asked him if he had any regrets in life. And the Dalai Lama said, absolutely. And the reporter said, can you tell me of one? And the Dalai Lama said that when he was a young, a young man first installed in this role as the Dalai Lama, an older monk came to him asking permission to do these spiritual practices that were very rigorous. They're really designed for a, a much younger man. And the Dalai Lama told him, uh, that, no, he shouldn't do those. He should continue doing the practice he was doing because they're more suited to being an old older man. And the Dalai Lama said he found out years ago that, that this monk had committed suicide in the belief that he would pick up a younger man's bodies to continue doing those practices. And the uh, reporter said, well, when you found that out, how did how did you feel? And the, the Dalai Lama said, just horrible regret, you know, and so much self-recrimination and, and so much judgment. And the reporter asked him, well, how did you make that go away? And the Dalai Lama looked at him incredulously and he said, I didn't. It's still there. It's a question of how I hold it. It's a question now of how I relate to it. And I love that story. Because when I look back at, at my regrets, the things I really wish I had done differently, they're still there. But if I can really feel them and sense, given that, how do I want to live forward? What's my intention in living forward? There can be real clarity, you know, clarity where there wasn't before. When I was about age, maybe six or seven, I first ran across the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I remember hearing that, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I was, I remember being so struck by the, by the beauty of that, the perfection of that. And that sense of like, what if everyone lived that way? What a, what an ideal world it would be. I remember that so clearly being struck by that. And so many of the great world traditions some of them use have the golden rule kind of as their basis, but they all have guidelines. All great traditions have have as as their foundation these ethical guidelines on how to live, things to avoid, and things to practice. So we have the Ten Commandments, of course, in Christianity. In Islam, there's a there's a whole code of conduct. In, in yoga philosophy, they, they basically they break down 
what's equivalent to the Ten Commandments and to five observances and five restraints. The things you do are going to cultivate a more wholesome state and the things you don't do because they're going to pull you away from what might be most important in your life. And in, in the Buddhist tradition, we have sila, which are, are sometimes referred to as the precepts. And these are five, five essential guidelines on how to cultivate a more, more wholesome life. But what's interesting is when you look at these guidelines, they're wide open to interpretation. So one of them, the first one says, to refrain from taking life, from, from killing any creature. For some, that's non-harming and being vegan. Some traditions, in some Buddhist traditions, it's like, well, just don't be the person doing the killing. And then in some traditions, they say, be grateful for what you have. So you can kind of see the span. Another, another precept in the Buddhist tradition is to refrain from taking what is not freely given. Basically, don't steal. And again, we have a span. Some people interpret that as, as living a life of renunciation. Don't own anything. As we used to say in the ashram, you know, no car, no car problems. For others, it's live simply. Live as simply on the earth as you can. And for others, it's simply remember that all things are impermanent. There's a story of how the Buddha, uh, a very wealthy man, one of the, one of the benefactors of the Buddha, said, look, I, I don't want to give my stuff away. I like my stuff. Can I still live this life and, and wake up to reality, wake up to truth without giving it all away? And the Buddha reportedly said, yes, you can, but it's very challenging. But you have to remember that everything will one day fall away. So again, one way is to live this life with real gratitude, knowing that whatever you have one day will disappear. Another precept is to refrain from misuse of the senses in sexual misconduct and overindulging into the senses because of the harm that we can do through, through sexual misconduct. And, and again, different traditions say different things. Some say, well, that means we need to be celibate. Others say, well, no, we just need to be more mindful, be very, very aware of how you use your energy through your speech and your thoughts and your actions. Other traditions say, well, actually, sexuality is a spiritual practice, so engage into it mindfully. It's actually a tool for liberation, like you know, the tantra practices. Another precept is to refrain from, from wrong speech, to refrain from lying, to refrain from gossip. That's interpreted by some as, okay, that means silence. Don't speak. And for others, it's around, again, being mindful. To ask yourself at all times, you know, the acronym of WAIT, why am I talking? Is what I'm saying helpful? Is what I'm saying true? Is what I'm saying kind? Is what I'm saying something the other person can hear? To hold that in the foreground of your awareness in all your relationships. And the fifth precept is to refrain from intoxicants that cloud the mind. For some, that's abstinence. For some, that's being mindful in, in usage. And for some, it's actually, well, some, there are some substances that are mind-expanding that can be very, very powerful and actually can, can awaken consciousness. So, so that's part of the equation as well. All the studies now on 
psilocybin and MDMA and LSD and its effect on consciousness. And there's some very, very powerful cutting-edge stuff happening right now. So the bottom line is, here are all these guidelines with an infinite number of interpretations. And what that leaves you with is, what are the rules that you want to live by? What are the precepts by which you will steer your own boat in order so that at the end of your life, you look back with minimal regret? One of the things I so enjoy about about Buddhist practice is that there are, certainly you'll find some traditions that will tell you precisely what to do and not to do. But to me, in its own pure form, you know, the Buddha allegedly said, you must take responsibility for your own awakening. Be a light unto yourself. And that means all you, all you can do is sense what is true for you. Practice diligently and keep evaluating how you're doing. So then the question becomes, as we name regrets, as we make room for them, as we heal them, as we forgive ourselves and forgive others, the question really comes down to is, how do you want to live forward? How do you want to live the rest of your life, knowing that your time is not guaranteed? And that becomes a very powerful personal question, but it's also a very powerful relational question. I think the really, like the distilled conversation in an in intimate relationship is, this is what I'm called to in my life. This is what lights me up. This is how I want to live my life, knowing my days are not guaranteed. How do you want to live your life? What lights you up? And where in here is our relationship? How do we support each other? So some people have a bucket list, things you want to do. Maybe you've heard that, that talk. I think Obama gave a talk. He said how some people have a bucket list, and he has another, another list, and the word starts with F. <laughs> what are the things you're not going to do? What are the things you're going to let fall away? So I thought we might do uh, a reflection here as we get toward the end of this talk. There's a this beautiful reflection on. It's sometimes it's called the rocking chair test. Mm-hmm. When you're 102 years old, sitting on your rocker on the back porch, looking back, what will have been most important in your life? So, if you like, you can close your eyes, and we'll take a few moments here just to settle. You might slow down and deepen your breath. And again, relax the face and the tongue, the lips, the belly. One of the more powerful practices I run across to help inform my intention is to reflect on how I want to feel at the end. And you might choose a time in the future. Maybe since we're here at the new year, maybe it's maybe it's one year from now. Or you might even just imagine as you're coming into your last breaths. Find a time in the future And you might ask yourself, how do I want to feel at this time? Slow down, deepen your breath. Take some time to investigate this. How do you want to feel?
and you might to bring it a little more alive is take that feeling inside and imagine you could express it on your face. What information does this have for you? And if that version of you in the future could offer you some advice now, what would it say? What does it want you to know? And there are three things that you might reflect on. If you were to live a life cultivating that feeling, what attitude adjustment would be required? What behaviors would be required? And what kind of support would you need? And you might now begin to slow down and deepen your breath once again. And again, just make contact with how you would like to feel. And you might inquire if that feeling is not here right now in some form. As you're ready, you can deepen your breath. And if you like, you can open your eyes. I found in my experience and in my practice that naming your regrets is takes a tremendous amount of courage because there's always an underbelly of really deep feelings there. Feelings of disappointment, of shame, and on and on and on. But when we reflect on the inherent lessons in those regrets and how we want to move forward, it can be quite empowering. One, one regret that I, that I carry is I, I grew up on a farm and I, I worked on farms. And uh, all through college, I, I worked on a farm, managing a thousand acre farm and uh, out in the Midwest. And I was the livestock manager. We had 500 hogs. And initially, I was really excited, you know, 125 little piglets every four months. And I was really good at taking care of them. And then I was tasked with driving the barrows, the, uh, once they'd grown out to 250 pounds, taking them to market. And the, the absolute horror of the this the sounds of these animals I had cared for, you know, being um, stuck with electro electrodes and the the screams and the uh, in the slaughterhouse of these terrified animals. It was one of those moments of of kind of the shock of what I was participating in, and how many years I had actively participated in that. And I realized how easily I could just stay stuck in that regret. But it's deeply informed my choices, you know, eating a plant-based diet and recognizing, you know, animals that don't have a voice, I have the opportunity to be a voice for them. And there's something about whatever activism I have there, it's not so much informed by anger, although at times there's frustration and anger there, but it's really informed by a deep, a deep sense of, of what that, that moment of what that recognition felt like inside. So I really feel there are tremendous opportunities that arise 
from taking time to sit with your regrets and to really ask yourself, what do you know now that you did not know then? And how can you move forward in a way that feels wholesome and alive? And just to close with uh, these lines from uh, Steve Jobs. He didn't, he didn't waste time in his words. He said, your time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. Everything else is secondary. So may that be so for all of us.